Hey, what's up everybody? Today, we're gonna to be talking about a very cool method in machine learning and data science to reduce the dimensionality of a data set who has very, very high dimensional data in a very different way than, for example, principal component analysis. And at the end of the video, we'll talk about pros and cons of those two methods. But this method is officially called the T-Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. That's a very long title. I couldn't even fit all of the words without these little abbreviations here. So people typically call it T-SNE. So we have T-S-N-E, T-SNE. And as we were saying before, the idea is that we come to this method with a bunch of data points in a pretty high dimensional space. So we have n data points, x1, x2, all the way to xn, and each of these are vectors in a very high dimensional space. You can think of dozens or hundreds or even thousands of dimensions for each of these vectors. And our goal is to eventually get a set of n vectors, y1, y2, all the way to yn, who are in a much, much lower dimensional space, typically a two or three dimensional space, which lets us do things like visualize this data, which we couldn't do before. So we're gonna start by asking a series of questions. The key insight, the key idea behind TSNE and what makes it fundamentally different from PCA is that TSNE is operating on a unit by unit level. So it's looking at X1 and X2 and trying to preserve something about the relationship between those two data points in your original data. It's trying to preserve that relationship in the new data, which is gonna be in lower dimensions. So it's working on a pair by pair basis whereas PCA is working on a more global level. We'll say a lot more on that later. The first question we're gonna ask here is given some data point in this set of n data points, xi, what's the probability that it would pick some other data point, xj, as its neighbor? This kind of seems like a vague question, but we can quantify, we can define that quantity as pj given i. So this notation says, given that you are the data point i, What's the probability that you would pick the data point J as your neighbor? Now, there's lots of ways you could define this, but one very natural way is going to be making it a function of the distance between XI and XJ, again, in this high dimensional space. So we're gonna say the probability that if I'm I, I would pick J as my neighbor is gonna be some function. I don't know what the function looks like yet, but it's gonna be some function of the distance between XI and XJ. The smaller this distance is, the more likely I would want to pick that one as my neighbor because it's closer to me. The further this data point xj is, the less likely I want to pick it as my neighbor. Now, this formulation almost makes sense, but it ignores the fact that there's all these other data points going on in our data. There's not just xi and xj. Imagine you're xi and you're being asked, who are you gonna pick as your neighbor? Well, I need to know information about all the other data points. Are there others that are way closer to me? Is XJ actually the closest to me and everyone else is further away? So while this attempt number one does start getting us to the right place, we're going to need to expand what our function is based on. So we're gonna say this probability is now a function of, I've just made a shorter notation here, dij squared is just this distance between i and j squared. And it's gonna include information about the same distances from i to all of the other data points in our data. So all distances i, k, where k is not equal to i or not equal to j. And whatever function this is, is gonna to need to have a couple properties. And I've noticed now I've got these reversed. So we're doing this in real time. Let me fix this. So this is gonna be negative and this is gonna be positive. So the first property is that the bigger the distance gets between i and j, the lower we're gonna have the probability I would pick that as my neighbor. It's gonna be negatively correlated. And the other property is for all the other data points that I'm not considering that are not equal to i or j, if the distance to them gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then everything else held constant, j becomes more and more attractive because it's relatively closer to me. And so my probability should go up in that situation. So what might such a function f look like? And the authors of TSNE recommend using this function here, which is going to seemingly come out of nowhere, but I'll try to motivate it as best I can. So they say this function, pji, the probability I would pick j as my neighbor if I am the data point i, is going to be this very ugly looking form, but if you stare at it for a little bit and try to remember what it looks like from your introductory statistics courses, this exactly looks like the division of two normal probability density functions, two Gaussian probability density functions. And that's exactly where the motivating comes from. So the paper authors say that we're going to assign these probabilities, pj given i, proportional to the density of a normal 
of a normal distribution of the distance. So the main things we should check first are, do the properties you want out of this function, based on what we just came up with here, actually hold? Well, this distance here, so this guy here is the distance between xi and xj squared. If this increases, then because there's a negative sign in front of it, the whole exponent here is going to decrease. And if we take e to the power of an ever decreasing number, then the entire numerator is going to decrease. So we exactly have the first criteria. And we can see it, we also have the second criteria met. If any of the other data points who are not equal to i or j in the denominator, if they increase, then the entire denominator is going to decrease and therefore the entire probability is going to increase exactly as we wanted. So while this form itself may seemingly come out of nowhere and to be quite honest with you, we probably could have chosen different forms. This was just the form that was chosen perhaps for mathematical convenience in the actual algorithm. The properties we want do in fact hold and that's all we really care about for right now. But the motivating factor behind this was that we're going to assume that as the distance moves further away, the probability that you would choose data point j uh, if you were data point i is going to be proportional to the normal distribution of the distances between those two and also the distances between you and all the other data points that exist out there. So the next question we're going to ask is, well, this was telling us about data points i and data point j. Let's zoom out a little bit and say, if we were to pick a point at random from all of our n data points, What's the probability that i and j end up grouped together? Well, this could happen in two different situations. The first is that the random point we chose is data point i. That happens with the one over n probability because all the data points have equal probability of being picked in this situation. And given we chose data point i, what's the probability that it would choose data point j as its neighbor? Well, that's exactly what we spent so much time coming up with here. And that's exactly the quantity pj given i. Now there's one other way that we could have i and j grouped, and that would be if the data point we pick in this little experiment here was data point j. And if we pick data point j, which happens with the one over n probability, then the probability that i and j would be grouped is now the same as the probability that data point j would pick data point i, which is going to be just the opposite here. So given I'm data point j, what's the probability I pick data point i? And now these two things together, if we do this multiplication and this addition, we're going to define as pij, which is going to be some form of similarity score between the data points i and j, because that represents the probability that they would end up together in a group. And this captures both, it's kind of a balance, in fact, it's a literal averaging between this pji and this pij. So we can put pji plus p i, j, and we divide that by the number of data points there are. And this gives us a score which we can interpret as a probability of i and j being similar to each other. And this is all going to be based on their physical closeness to each other in this high dimensional space. Now there's a note that I kind of glanced over here. Some of you might be wondering, how do I pick this sigma i? Because when you have a Gaussian distribution, it's defined by a mean and a standard deviation. And I didn't really talk about how that standard deviation which based on the subscript i seems to be a function of i gets set. There's a ton more details in the original paper, which I'll link in the description below, but here's the general intuition. We're going to pick that standard deviation dynamically for each of our data points from one to n, so that it's going to fit a certain number. In general, it's gonna fit a certain number of neighboring data points in some number of standard deviations of that Gaussian distribution. And so that seems a little bit abstract, but let me make it a little bit more concrete here. Now, let's say you're looking at some data point i, and you're looking at all the other data points and what distance they have away from your data point i. So this vertical line here is going to be a distance zero, and I didn't even need the negative side of this plot, should have really just drawn the positive side. But let's say you have four other data points that are right here. So you would use this red distribution here. If your rule was something like Within the first two standard deviations of my normal distribution, which would cut off around here, I want four data points. And that's exactly what we've been able to achieve. Within this first two standard deviations, you have four data points. Now here's a different case you have for a different data point x sub i that you might be looking at. Let's say that its neighbors are here, 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 and here. Now you can't use that same red normal distribution because if you were to, then the first two standard deviations, you only have two data points. There's this sparsity issue going on. And so we allow this sigma sub i to be dynamic so that we can use this black 
normal distribution here because within its first two standard deviations, we do have now those four uh, neighboring data points. So there are a lot more details. I am oversimplifying it a little bit here, but the general idea is that if around whatever point you're looking at, there's a lot of very close neighbors, so it's in a very dense part of the space, then you can set sigma sub i to be low. You don't need a really big standard deviation for your normal distribution. If on the other hand, your data point xi is in a very sparse part of the space, where it's here, but its closest neighbors are like really far away, which is the situation we were looking at with this black points here, then you wanna set that standard deviation appropriately to be higher. So let's take stock of where we're at. So far, we have pij, which is gonna give us some measure of similarity between the data point i and the data point j. And now we can start talking about how do we get to that lower dimensional space? The goal is to learn a low dimensional representation. Again, in TSNE, that usually means a two or three dimensional representation because people typically want to do this so that they can actually visualize their data on some kind of plot. So we're gonna translate our x1, x2, all the way to xn, which are high dimensional, into y1, y2, all the way to yn, which are low dimensional. For example, they could be in two dimensional space. And we wanna do it in such a way that we're going to preserve the similarity that we just computed, which are again, these pijs, between data points xi and xj. So if the similarity between data points x1 and x2 was like 0.1, then we wanna do our best to preserve that similarity in the data points y1 and y2, even though they're in a lower dimensional space. And this is probably the most important part of the video, the intuition, the goal we're trying to do. The how is really just more mechanics, but the power behind TSNI is that it's looking at pairs of data points and seeing what similarity we gave it based on this formulation here and saying that, you know what? I know we wanna put the data in a lower dimensional space, but I don't wanna sacrifice on these similarities. I wanna preserve these local structures between my data points that were there before. I want those local structures to still be there right now. And now we can get into the actual mechanics. How are we gonna actually do this? Well, why don't we just try the most straightforward thing first based on what we've already used in this method so far? And that's gonna be just like with the X's, how we measured this similarity using this Gaussian framework. Why don't we just do the exact same thing with the Y's? So just like for the X's, we measure the similarities using the Gaussian, just do the same thing with the Y's, measure them using the Gaussian. And now you'll have some values QIJ, which are the similarities between the Y's. And now all you need to do is make sure the QIJ's and the PIJ's are similar to each other. Now, that is a great first attempt and avoids any unnecessary complications, but we should talk about a very subtle thing that goes wrong when we do that. And this is all under the umbrella of the curse of dimensionality, which we knew was gonna come along when we're dealing with very high dimensional data. And here's how it rears its ugly head. To demonstrate this, I'm just gonna show in two and three dimensions. So we're going to treat our two dimensional space as our target space for TSNI. And we're gonna say the three dimensional space is the original space the data points are in. Of course, your data points are probably gonna be in a way higher dimensional space, but this is just for illustration. What I wanna do here in two dimensions, because I can draw in two dimensions for you all, not well apparently, but what I'm gonna do in two dimensions is draw an area of two dimensional space who has a distance of one from the origin. And that's this little green circle here. And we're gonna call this the nearby area. All these points are gonna be nearby to whatever my target data point in the origin is. This blue area, we're gonna call the mid distance area. So it's between a distance of one and two. And what I wanna do here is a very simple equation. I want to divide the area of the mid region, which is this outer blue ring, by the area of the near region, which is this inner green circle. Now we know how to do it, just pi r squared is the area of a circle. And so the area of the mid region is gonna be the area of this big circle minus the area of the small circle, which is the numerator. And the uh, area of the nearby is just gonna be the area of the small circle or pi one squared. And we get that that ratio is equal to three. So what this means is that the mid size, the area of the mid region where those data points who are a middle distance away from me is three times the area of the uh, data points who are allowed to be a near distance from me. Now stay with me here, let's do this for one dimension up. In this case, we're not dealing with areas, we're dealing with volumes and I haven't even dared to draw it, but you can visualize a sphere of points who all have a distance of one or less from the origin or the unit sphere. 
is going to be what we're calling the volume of the nearby region in three dimensions, very analogous to the area of the nearby region in two dimensions. And the volume of the mid in three dimensions is going to be the area between a sphere who has distance two, just like we had this circle with distance two, everything between the outside of that and the outside of the inner sphere. So we can do a very simpler formula. We appeal to the volume of a sphere here, and we get that the ratio is equal to seven. And now, here's the punchline. In two-dimensional space, we found that the area of the mid data points was three times the area of the near data points. But in three-dimensional space, the volume in which the mid-level data points are allowed to occupy is a whole seven times bigger than the volume that the nearby data points are allowed to occupy. And where this is all leading up to, how we can verbalize the problem here is exactly like this. When we're going from a high dimensional space to a low dimensional space, in this case, just kind of trivializing it, going from a three dimensional space to a two dimensional space, we're trying to take all these mid-level data points who are a mid distance away from whatever target data point we care about. And that has, you can say, a size of seven. And we're trying to pack that into a mid size area in the lower dimensional space who has a, you can say, size of three. So the problem is that we're trying to pack all the midpoints in high dimensional space, the midpoints in a high dimensional space, into a much, much smaller space in a lower dimension. And the problem doesn't seem so pronounced with just two and three dimensions, but imagine that your data point has just 10 dimensions, which is not crazy by any data science standards. Typically when we use T-SNE, we're trying to embed like thousand or hundred dimensional embeddings. Even if your data just has 10 dimensions, this problem becomes such that you're trying to take a mid size space, and I'm kind of using this word loosey goosey, but what I'm really trying to say is the area in that higher dimensional space, which is occupied by the data points who are a moderate distance away from you. And with a 10 dimensional space that has a 1023 ratio with the nearby area, and as we saw in a two dimensional space that has a ratio of just three. So we run into just this kind of like, I'm running out of space. I can't take all the data points who have a certain characteristic in a high dimension and pack them into the same characteristic in the low dimension. There's just not enough room in that low dimensional space. And the way we solve for that is actually changing up our definition of similarity in that lower dimensional space. And we do that in a visual way. So in the high dimensional space, we are using this normal distribution where the x-axis here is distance away from your target data point. And the y-axis is telling you what's the probability that I would pick that data point as my neighbor. And as we said, this drops off as a Gaussian. The further the data point away, the lower that we have this probability you pick it as your neighbor and the trend is Gaussian. Now, as we said, let's focus on a very specific area of this plot between distances of one and two, which is what we were classifying as moderate distances in the high dimensional space. Now, if it's a distance of one away, then the probability I would pick that as my neighbor is around here. And if it's a distance of two away, the probability I would pick that as my neighbor is like right here. But as we said, in the low dimensional space, we don't have enough room. And so the way we solve that is just by changing, expanding our definition of what it means to be in a mid-dimensional space. The, the area between one and two distance is just too restrictive. I need a lot more range to work with in order to fit all these data points that you want me to fit. And so what we might say, for example, is I want the whole range between distances one and four. And what that implies is that whatever probability we had for picking J as our neighbor, if its distance was two, we now need to accept that same probability if the distance is four, because we're expanding the definition of what it means to have a mid dimension, since we didn't have enough space in that lower dimensional uh, space. So what that means is that if we continue this line, which was at two, we're now asking for that line to be at four. And what this implies, even though I really should have drawn this more exaggerated, what this implies is that whatever distribution we're now using, to translate distances to scores or probabilities is going to need to have much heavier tails than the normal distribution. Because if we try to draw this thing now, it can't fall off at the same rate as the normal distribution. It needs to fall off at a much heavier tail. It needs to maintain a higher probability for longer and longer and longer. And therefore we can't use a normal distribution at all because its tails fall off at the same rate, no matter what uh, standard deviation you're talking about. So we switch in our lower dimensional space 
to a heavier tailed student's t distribution with a degree of freedom equals equals one, which is actually the same thing as a Cauchy distribution. Now, you don't need to at all get into the nitty gritty of what these distributions are and their PDFs or anything. Really, I just want you to focus on the picture here. We're just picking a distribution who has a heavier tail than the normal distribution. And the reason we're doing that is to deal with this curse of dimensionality issue. And the main thing you need to realize between these two plots is that whatever the probability was at two in the higher dimensional space, we're asking the probability to remain there for longer and longer and longer to accommodate higher and higher and higher distances away to have the same property, to have the same similarity as we did for these smaller distances in the high dimensional space. So this honestly was the part of learning about this algorithm that took the most time for me to wrap my head around. I was like, what is going on? Why are we not just using the normal distribution? This seems to have come out of nowhere. But I'm hoping that perhaps I over explained it here and it was pretty obvious to you, but I would rather over explain than under explain because you can always just seek the video to where you want. But hopefully this helped motivate why we are using a student's t distribution and the other reason I really wanted to get that across is because it's in the name of this whole thing. It's called the t-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding. And while we're on this page, let's make sure we understand where all these terms come from. We know exactly about the t-distribution part now. Uh, stochastic, because this is all based on random processes. We're dealing with probabilities here. Neighbor, because we're dealing on a neighbor by neighbor basis. That's the basis on which this algorithm works. And embedding, because we're trying to get our high dimensional embeddings, which we are at here, to a much lower dimensional space, which is where we are going right now. So we're almost done here. Now that we've accepted that we're gonna use a one degree of freedom student's t distribution, more simply known as a Cauchy distribution, we can go ahead and just do the same form as we had a couple of pages ago. So this form, while it looks complicated, is really just mirroring the pij form we had before. So now we're saying qij, which is going to be the similarity or the probability between the ith and jth of your new, your lower dimensional embeddings, yi, yj, is gonna be defined in this way. And the reason the form looks like this is because that's the probability density function of the Cauchy distribution or the student's t distribution with one degree of freedom. And the denominator, we're of course normalizing that by dividing by all of the other data points that exist in there. The final step is that, well, now we have our PIJs, which tell us how similar the higher dimensional embeddings were for I and J. We have QIJ, which tells us how similar our lower dimensional embeddings were for data points I and J. We want them to be close to each other because that's the whole point of TSNE is that we wanna make sure that if PIJ was a certain number, QIJ should be as close to that as possible. And we can show that PIJ and QIJ are both probability distributions. And what does it mean for us to enforce that two probability distributions are close to each other? We can use our good friend, the KL divergence. And we have a whole video on KL divergence. I'll post that below. But in a nutshell, it's just telling us what's the level of difference between two probability distributions. We want the KL divergence between the P, which is the original high dimensional similarities, and Q, which is the new low dimensional similarities, to be very small. Ideally, we want it to be zero, but we can't have everything we want because we're going, we're losing information by going to low dimensions. So we want it to be as low as possible. And finally, the way we actually find these y's is via gradient descent. So you can think of this as our loss function. And we can just take the derivative of this loss function with respect to all these yi's and yj's and move the yi's and yj's until the KL divergence is as low as possible. And so that's it. That is the idea behind t -SNE. The key idea, even though there was seemingly a lot of math here, the key idea is really that t -SNE is looking on an individual data point by data point basis. And here we can have a quick discussion on how it's different than PCA. t -SNE is more complicated than PCA. It's, in, it's asking for more. It's saying, not only do I care about general trends in your data set, like PCA does. PCA, remember, is talking about what is the direction of the maximum variance of your data set? I'm going to choose that as my first principal component. Then what's the next dimension of the highest variance of your data set? That's kind of looking on a global level about what's the variance of your entire data set. t -SNE is much more zoomed in. It's looking on an individual I and J data point level and trying to enforce that local structure there. So it typically does a lot better job of clustering 
of making sure that if two data points were close in that high dimension, they're close in this lower dimension. But it also comes with that added computational complexity. Because we do need to care about things on a pair by pair basis, it's gonna take a lot longer for TSNE to run on the same data set than PCA. Because PCA, at the end of the day, even though it is a bit complicated, is just doing a bunch of these linear transformations on your data. And that brings us to the final point for this video is that PCA is a linear method. As much as it's going on in PCA, it's just doing linear transformations. It's assuming linear correlations. And so it works really well for linear data. But TSNE has no such assumptions. It's again, just looking at pairs of data points, makes no assumption about linearity, and therefore it can work a lot better when your data set is not linear. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you learned a lot better than you did before about how TSNE works. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the section below. Thank you so much for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this. I'll catch all you wonderful people next time.